Hello, everybody. I'm Karen Sear. I'm a biology professor at Bowling Green State University, and I am a scientist. Um, what image comes to mind when you think of the word scientist? Uh, popular media, television, uh, mass media, pop culture might have us think, uh, have you think that we're all mad, right? We're a bunch of mad scientists. Or you may uh, think that we're uh, hustling strange concoctions and uh, remedies and inventions and uh, 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 trying to hustle you. Uh, you may have the more traditional view of a scientist as somebody in a, in a lab coat uh, peering into a microscope at obscure uh, phenomenon. Um, but I'd like you to, uh, hopefully at the end of these few minutes that I have today, uh, convince you that we're all scientists. We all need to develop our science thinking skills. Um, it's, uh, we all start out with some scientific thinking skills. Uh, my daughters in the high chair when they were little, um, they drop the spoon. Mommy smiles and picks it up and puts it back on the, on the tray. They drop it again, repeating the experiment, repeatedly to see if the data is reprodu reproducible. Right? They may uh, change the variables a little bit. Instead of dropping the spoon, they may gl uh, get a big glob of oatmeal and throw the spoon and see if they get a different effect. Right? But we can only get so far uh, with um, these sort of inherent scientific thinking skills. Without explicit training, uh, we're not going to be able to get these scientific thinking skills up to the level we need to make the types of decisions we need to make today. Um, so uh, there's all kinds of ways we make decisions. Uh, we make decisions based on uh, moral and ethical uh, reasoning. We make decisions based on values we may have learned from our families. We make decisions based on uh, higher authorities, perhaps from our religious uh, teachings. But we also need to have another tool in our toolkit, and that's scientific thinking skills, in order to help us make decisions to get to the results that we want. If we have a desired outcome, we can base some of those decisions on facts, on reality. We're more likely to get what we want. Um, consider uh, just as a consumer. Uh, uh, when you're shopping, trying to decide uh, what, you, what will be best for you, uh, what will be the healthiest choices in the, in the, uh, for food, what will be best for your economy, um, what will be best for the environment. Um, scientific thinking skills can help you with these types of decisions. They can help you, of course, with, uh, with health decisions for yourself and your, lo your loved ones, healthcare decisions. Um, it, scientific thinking skills are important for even making decisions about uh, how we live on this planet. Um, what types of choices we make in terms of the environmental impact, the um, making sustainable choices for how to run our communities, uh, choices at the uh, ballot box, and um, uh, scientific thinking skills will help us with all of those types of decisions. Um, and there's re we're really in a crisis right now. Um, so the, the vast majority, well, there's a huge, a huge problem right now. The scientific thinking skills of the population are really faulty. They're really limited. They're not up to the speed that we need in order to envision and reimagine the type of Toledo and world that we're, we're aiming for. Consider that $10 billion is spent annually on pseudoscience, fake medical treatments and remedies. This dwarfs the amount that's spent on actual science research for medicine. Okay. <clears throat> um, we're inundated with information. There's a ton of information coming at us all the time, and everybody has access to this information. So we need to make sure that everybody can navigate this information in a way that's, that's based on evidence and so that choices can be made that are, are, are going to get to us where we want to be. Um, so and make sure that we don't get fooled. Okay? We need to have these sort of scientific thinking skills so we don't get fooled. So consider this question. Um, there's a cabin on the side of a mountain, um, and three people inside, and they're all dead. Um, how did they die? Just think about it for a second. The three people were actually the pilot, the co-pilot, and the navigator, right? So you were probably thinking of a cabin, a log cabin in the woods, and not thinking of this type of, of cabin, an uh, airplane cabin. Here's another one. Uh, a woman leaves home and makes three left turns. And on the way, uh, she passes two women with masks. Who were those two women? They were the umpire and the catcher. Again, you were probably thinking that she was going for a walk in the city after leaving her home. So we make assumptions like this all the time. And these false assumptions can lead us astray and, 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 uh, and trip us up when we're trying to make choices. Um, look at this image for a second. What do you see? Do you see the, the young woman? Or do you see the old hag? Can you see both? What about this image? Um, which line looks longer? Which appears longer, the vertical line or the horizontal line? If we pull out that vertical line and then tip the, the figure over, you can see that they're exactly the same length. Yet it appeared to us that it, one, one was longer. So things aren't, even, uh, aren't as they always appear. And sometimes we can't even trust our own senses to give us objective information. So science is a tool then that allows us to overcome these gaps in our thinking. 
these gaps, these habits of mind, these biases, these, these uh, products that of our autonomous mind, and helps us overcome that and, and see things in a very objective way. Um, so how did you learn science? Uh, you probably remember lugging around these giant textbooks, expensive, really heavy, um, packed with detailed information about how the natural world works. Um, and if you look at chapter one of most of these textbooks, there's an explanation about the scientific method, the scientific method. And students memorize a little series of steps, and you can probably re uh, recall this now that I'm, you know, some of you probably painfully recalling some of the steps of the, the scientific method that you had to memorize. Um, and, uh, and even though students can throw around these, these words of the scientific method, hypothesis, conclusion, independent variable, dependent variable, does that mean they really know how to think scientifically? Um, it's like this. The teacher can say, I taught my dog to whistle. And you ask, well, I don't hear him whistle. You say, I taught him. I didn't say he learned it. And so we need to really think about this really carefully. When we think about teaching science, we have to ask ourselves, what does it mean when somebody understands the scientific method? What does it mean? It's not only what they know that's important. It's what they're able to do that's important. And what kind of connections and problems can be solved using the scientific method. That's what's really important. And so there's a lot, we can apply science to the science of learning. There's a lot that's known about how the mind works and how people learn. And we know that the brain, and we know a lot about how the brain works. And we know that it's not just an empty vessel waiting to be filled up with knowledge. It doesn't work this way. This, is, this isn't how people learn. And in fact, it's much more complicated. And there's a lot of evidence that helps us understand that, that people learn by making connections with prior knowledge that they already have. And we need to use this evidence about how people learn and how the mind works in order to help students learn to think and to, to make good decisions. And um, there's a huge body of evidence that says that, um, uh, and I hate to say it today because we're all doing it, but um, that teaching by telling, by standing up and lecturing for an hour, is, is a very ineffective way of helping students learn. Um, a vast majority of them will not remember what you told them uh, for any long-term and lasting way. Um, and it's really obvious if you think about it. Um, think about going to the beach and, and what type of instruction would you have hoped that the lifeguard at the beach has had? Would you have liked them to have heard a lecture, perhaps from an Olympic swimmer, you know, fabulous speaker, who explains the proper way to swim and the right strokes and the right rescue techniques? Or would you rather have had them actually be in the pool, trying it out, getting some feedback, and learning how to actually do, do, this, the, the, um, do the swimming and do the rescue? Um, so what it boils down to then is that we have to be scientists in our teaching. We have to be scientists in our teaching and, and, and in our uh, envisioning Toledo and in, in the projects that we're developing and the, and the things that we're trying to do to move forward. We have to base it on the evidence of what's worked before about what's actually happening in the mind and in, in other communities, what works. Um, and so that we can design and implement new programs, new learning environments for our students and for our community. And then what we really need to do is measure whether these things are working for us so that we can go back and fine tune them and re-implement them, getting closer and closer to the goals that we have. Okay? And it's this assessment word that um, if you go to a faculty meeting, it's one of the seven dirty words you can't say at a faculty meeting. Right? Any, any teachers out there will understand this. But that's really where the science is. That's the evidence about what works. That's where we're finding out what's working or not working, that measuring of what's going on. And so we um, need to take that evidence and do stuff with it. We need to um, make sure that we're basing our teaching on the evidence. Because what we have is uh, a problem. Um, a vast majority of students and people, after, even after they graduate from college, um, see the world as black and white. Okay? They see science as a series of facts to be memorized, as a series of right or wrong answers on a multiple choice test. Okay? And, um, and this is not going to be very helpful if we're looking for creative solutions to today's problems. Um, we need to help students see that there are, it's much more complicated. Um, there's much more going on. There are many variables to consider, many variables to, to um, control and to think about before we draw any, any conclusions. So science then is a process of getting it less wrong. It's an evidence-based way of making decisions. It's a tool that we all need to have in our toolbox, one of the many decision-making tools we all need to have in our toolbox. Um, and I like to say, I tell my students that, that um, uh, uh, I try to teach them and help them appreciate Shades of Grey. And this isn't to be confused with that book and movie that everybody's talking about, okay? Um, but Shades of Grey is one of my favorite colors. And, and I think that if we um, help 
uh, everybody develop scientific thinking skills and use them. Use, even if we don't have them ourselves, find somebody who does to help, help us reason with evidence. We can get closer to the steps and solutions we need for, um, for uh, problems we have today. Thank you. It's been an honor.